Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I'm going to pick up on the um, point made by um, Ganesh uh, regarding the limited spread of, of global value chains from Asia to date. You know, why hasn't this experience been replicated? It is a really, really interesting um, question. Um, <coughs> I'm going to focus on Cambodia um, because Cambodia is located within the Asian region and uh, it has been able to tap into global value chains. Um, its approach has been very much uh, FDI-led and it's also been quite unusual um, in the fact that it's lacked uh, a strong industrial policy. It's only now that policymakers in Cambodia are thinking about the use of an industrial policy. Um, I'm also going to touch on some of the points that I know Franz will make in his presentation um, with regards to the top fears of countries regarding global value chains. And it's this fear of being locked into uh, a race to the bottom. Um, so Cambodia does... Um, shed some light on, on, on these concerns and how and why they, they might come about. Um, so briefly, I'll just run through recent trends. Um, I'll then talk about entering global value chains and upgrading within them. And I'm going to argue that it's actually quite easy to get into global value chains. It's once you're in them, how to upgrade. I mean, most countries are in a type of one type of value chain or another. It might be commodities, it might be a more intermediate goods trade um, and so on, but once you're in, how do you upgrade and how do you influence um, governance structures? So I'm going to touch on that mm -hmm. and uh, then draw on the experience of, of Cambodia and then I'll just conclude. Um, so Ganesh presented some recent statistics on uh, the degree of, of fragmentation of, of global trade. Um, and you know we have lots of these new databases coming out. Uh, the trade in value added database um, is, is shown up here on the slide, and really it's measuring this um, vertically fragmented uh, trade, intermediate goods trade. And we can see that there have been some shifts. So from Europe, uh, elsewhere, including Asia, um, Africa's share has increased, but it's really quite marginal. So, you know, there are clearly challenges. Some countries have been able to engage with this type of trade. Other countries uh, and regions are being uh, somewhat left behind. Um, so, you know, policymakers are, are rightly concerned to, to look at this, um, how and why this is the case. And uh, economists have begun to um, look at global value chains and, and distinguish between uh, kind of the, the tensions that create uh, the incentives. So there are incentives to in unbundle but then there are also incentives to uh, agglomerate um, certain functions together. And there are tensions between the two. Um, but they, they ultimately boil down to cost uh, considerations. So um, if you are, you're a factory, you, know, you can lower your costs by moving uh, parts of, of that production elsewhere where there may be lower labour costs uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so obviously, you know, policymakers can work <laughs> on reducing costs. Um, there's also an issue of capabilities, though, because when um, factories are deciding, you know, if they're deciding where to move their parts of, of production, um, it also depends on kind of host country capabilities. So um, it might be that uh, some functions are outsourced if, if uh, domestic capabilities exist, or um, the there might be like an offshoring process where the factory actually moves. Okay, so. Um, how, how this unbundling process take place, takes place um, depends also on existing capabilities and then that shapes how the, the value chain is, is governed. Um, we have this classification of, of global value chain governance and uh, the last type um, is a, a hierarchical structure and this is where this is considered to be um, kind of an FDI-led, characteristic of an FDI-led uh, global value chain and this is where domestic capabilities, <coughs> host country capabilities are quite low and therefore there does need to be quite a high degree of control by, by lead firms. And um, within the literature, and this is more the case study, uh, 1990s uh, kind of wave of literature, within this literature people have argued that this can be a very, very powerful tool so you can um, enter into a global value chain and you can upgrade your uh, labor uh, and so on but you're probably not you're going to find it quite difficult to upgrade your functional position within the value chain over time and this is what the experience of, of um, Cambodia um, really shows so I would argue that it's really important to make that the distinction between you know how do firms engage with global value chains what are the types of firms involved are, are we talking about domestic firms trying to access 
export markets and engage with lead firms? Or are we talking about a kind of zero trade where you know there are no domestic capabilities, the, the, G, the global value chain process is FDI-led? Because that, that distinction is important. It matters for upgrading um, trajectories. And there are authors that are questioning why go global? You know, why not look at um, regional markets uh, instead? Because these may be less tightly controlled by lead firms, offer more opportunities for upgrading and, and so on. But nevertheless, within FDI-led uh, global value chains, which is what Cambodia is in uh, for its uh, garment industry, um, it has certainly made impressive gains. And um, uh, lots of researchers are looking at this, you know, how can you maximize gains at this node of, of production? So ensure that you get social upgrading with economic uh, upgrading. Um, so Cambodia attracted uh, investment mainly from uh, Taiwan, some from China, the kind of East Asian NICs, um, and it entered the, the garment uh, global value chain, and it was extremely successful um, in doing so. And it was so successful that um, there was the US-Cambodia uh, textiles agreement was put in place to make sure um, that Cambodia uh, was adhering to labor standards. There were concerns about this race to the bottom because the, the growth of exports was so rapid. Um, so labor standards have um, developed over time in, in Cambodia, and they've been used to market the product as well. So it has... Um, it's been able to achieve uh, economic upgrading with social upgrading as well. It provides a lot of employment. It also pays um, high wages. Um, but there's been no change in, in Cambodia's functional position within the value chain over time. If anything, its role has kind of been consolidated. I mean, we haven't seen, you know, it's, um, it's still highly dependent on uh, garment exports as a share of total exports, and it hasn't really diversified. It hasn't really moved out. Um, and it's now that industrial policy is being considered, um, because previously there, there wasn't one. Um, there are issues around tax, um, and domestic capital accumulation processes do remain quite weak. Um, and the pressure's on now uh, for Cambodia, because as I've just presented some firm level data here, um, which shows that uh, gross product has, has, been, uh, has increased between 2006 and 2010 quite dramatically. Profit, though, and value added, uh, you know, it hasn't grown as much. Um, the cost of labour, though, has has increased, and um, labour um, is the labour standards um, and wages within this, within this sector have begun to be used on a kind of political party uh, political basis um, as well, because it's the main sector that drives formal um, employment um, within Cambodia. Um, so the pressure's on now you know, for Cambodia to attract more functions um, because it's, you know, labor costs are rising and so on. Um, press the pressure's on for um, firms that have re relocated to Cambodia and they do lobby for tax um, reductions. And um, the, the environment is quite liberal and uh, it's estimated that between um, 2003 and 2009 around half, around 50% of firms closed down and then reopened in another name in order to take advantage of, of these tax incentives. So this means that we're unable to kind of see um, normal um, upgrading, what you would call normal um, upgrading um, firm at, at the firm level. So old, we just looked at some of the differences between type one and type two firms and this is distinguishing between firms that have been in operation across the period and have not re-registered um, for tax reasons. And we really can't see any difference. So you know, the effect on this firm level um, behavior, I mean, I would argue that this really conforms to the, um, um, the framework I, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you're going to get rapid product and process upgrading, but over time, you're not really going to change your, your functional um, position unless, you know, you uh, negotiate with the investors in the right way. And I would argue, therefore, that foreign, the management of foreign direct investment should actually be the first um, consideration within this new kind of context of more hierarchical global value chains. You know, there are tax issues, um, you know, you've got intra-firm trade, it's around 30% nowadays, you know, how do you tax that um, effectively? Old benchmarks and frameworks no longer um, apply, so it's quite easy to get into global value chains, but once you're in them, you know, how do you move up and, and upgrade? That's more challenging. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Jody. So that's, uh, that gives us a new dimension to the, 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 the discussion about, uh, about benefiting from value chains. It's not just taking part in it, but it's also how you take part. And in particular, over the longer run, it's not just uh, uh, having jobs uh, at the beginning, but also then thinking through how can you uh, upgrade in terms of functions. Um, and, and then, of course, the question becomes, how can that be done? Uh, do we need liberalization plus, plus, plus uh, policies for it? And uh, that's something that Ganesh will no doubt tell us more <laughs> about uh, in a minute. Very good. Um, Yurendra, uh, let's, let's hear um, uh, on the case uh, of Nepal yeah. and whether global value chains have reached Nepal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, if so, which ones? And, uh, and what, uh, what, what are the implications for, uh, for Nepal? Yeah. 